Our scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and can be found on page 876 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great, cha- a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Please pray with me. Father, we walk by faith and not by sight, and we confess our weakness and ask that you would help us with our unbelief this morning. The things that we can see loom all around us, and we want to be men and women marked by faith who are confident in things yet not seen, and so help us this morning to receive this word by faith. Help my friends here to believe what you have revealed, and I pray that it would move us, that you would produce godly affections as a result of your word that would enable us to take our cross, deny ourselves, and to follow after your son. And so we pray that you'd minister to us during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know who the first American missionary was? Are you familiar with his heart-wrenching story, his life of sacrifice and devotion to Christ? Are you familiar with how he evangelized the lost? and planted churches. The first missionary sent out from the United States was Adoniram Judson. One of our buildings at the Nuts campus is named after him, Judson Hall. He was a missionary to Burma, a country today called Myanmar, a country that in 1812 had almost no Christian witness, zero witness. Adoniram Judson is a grand example of someone who lived life on mission He made great choices of sacrifice. He he spent himself for the sake of Christ. He relied on gospel proclamation and the power of God to build Christ's church. And in due time, he saw great fruit. Judson was born in Malden, Massachusetts, right here in New England, just north of Boston, some 200 miles southeast of here. He grew up in a gospel-preaching family. His dad was a pastor. But when he went to college and he attended Brown University, he rejected the faith that he had been taught as a boy. He met and became fast friends with a man named Jacob Eames. Now remember that name, Jacob Eames. Eames was a a deist. He was an agnostic and a skeptic. And he was smart, so he could keep pace with the brilliant Judson. And this friendship caused Adoniram to to stiffen against God, and he resolved to dismiss the God of the Bible. 
but his, his family continued to pray for him. His, his parents pled with him to come to Christ. And eventually, at around the age of 21, Judson was converted. God caused him to be born again. He repented and he put his faith in Christ. And for Judson, there was no turning back. He was forever transformed and, and determined to be a bold witness for Christ. And he immediately pursued the life of a missionary. He went to Andover Seminary in Massachusetts. He fell in love with a, a woman named Nancy. And listen to the letter that he wrote to Nancy's father asking for her hand in marriage. Listen to this letter. Again, Judson wrote this to Nancy's father asking for her hand in marriage. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall redound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. How about that for a request? <laughs> we can't even write like that anymore. <laughs> but can you imagine? Dads, what, what would you do with a letter like that? Wow. Well, Nancy's father consented, and he left the choice up to Nancy and gave his blessing. So Adoniram and Nancy married, and two weeks after their wedding, Two weeks, they set sail for India, which became a stepping stone to Burma. And they said goodbye to all their friends and family, never to see most of them again. And Judson spent 33 years in Burma before returning to the States and taking any kind of furlough, any kind of sabbatical. In total, he ministered the gospel there for nearly four decades. Adoniram and Nancy preached the gospel in Burma for six years before seeing one convert. Burma was a hot foreign land with much discomfort and much sickness. Judson lost seven of his 13 children to early death. His dear wife Nancy died, and he was alone after only 14 years of marriage. This sent him into a season of grief and depression, and he did remarry only to see his second wife die. So he buried two wives in Burma. And at one point, Judson was in prison for over a year and a half, placed in a lonely, dirty, torturous environment, unable to keep the work of the ministry going, unable to continue with it himself. He suffered much. He sacrificed much. He persevered through very difficult circumstances. And he was determined, remained determined, to proclaim Christ crucified all his days in times of harvest, and in times of dearth. He labored and he worked to promote the gospel right up until his death in 1850 at age 61. What causes a man, church, to live this way? What was going on in the heart and the mind of Adoniram Judson that, that compelled him to live life like this? What was he thinking? I mean, was he just crazy? And what about Nancy? She said yes to this man and followed earnestly after him. What about her? Together they laid down their lives selflessly and passionately for Christ. What motivated them? What truths from God's word gripped them and constrained them to live life like this? And what about you, CMC? How's your gospel motivation? Are you eager to serve Christ like the Judsons were eager to, see, uh, to serve Christ? If you're in Christ by faith, then you have the same spirit that Adoniram had. You have the same spirit that Nancy had. You have the same scriptures, and you follow the same Savior. And the same gospel truths that were real then remain real today. So what can help you eagerly live life 
on mission? What can help you to sacrifice enthusiastically? What's true about the gospel that will give you energy and ability to persevere and to press forward for the sake of Christ? Well, let's find out by turning to God's word together. Turn with me to Luke 24. We'll begin there, Luke 24. It's found on page 885 if you're using a black pew Bible. And while you're turning there, before we read from Luke, you know that Jesus Christ himself promised to build his church. In Matthew 16, Peter makes the grand profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus pronounces a blessing on Peter. And he says, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus declares it. I will build my church. So Jesus will succeed in completing the construction project that is the church. As the Giddy Hem, Giddy Hem, <laughs> the Getty Hymn says, Christ will have the prize for which he died. He will. But how? That's the question. How is Jesus building his church? L look at Luke 24, beginning in verse 45. This is the Great Commission according to Luke. Then he opened their minds, Jesus did, to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. When you understand the scriptures, when you understand the Bible, you see that it's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had to suffer, the climactic expression of which was his death on the cross in place of sinners. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. And Jesus tells the disciples in verse 47 that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be what? Proclaimed. Proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus instructs the disciples and he instructs you and me that gospel proclamation is the necessary means by which he'll build the church. Disciples are made, the mission is advanced through proclamation, through heralding the gospel preaching Christ crucified. That's what it means to be a witness, to bear testimony about the death and the resurrection of Christ. And Jesus tells his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until God himself empowers them to be his witnesses. Now the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, as you know, were both written by Luke. It's kind of like there's Luke volume 1 and Luke volume 2. So go with me to the book of Acts page 909, and let's look briefly at how the disciples did exactly what Jesus told them to do. So Acts, right after the Gospel of John. In chapter 1, Luke picks right up where his Gospel left off. And in verse 8 of chapter 1, he says to the disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, just like in Luke 24, in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So the book of Acts is a chronicle of the disciples as Christ's witnesses building the church. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, Samaria, and then to the end of the earth, the Gentiles. And how do they do it? Proclamation. Proclamation of the gospel. For example, look at chapter 2, verse 14. When Peter sees a multitude of Jews gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, what does he do? Verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. He just talks to them. It's very simple. He speaks. He preaches. He proclaims the gospel. Do you see that? He tells them about Christ crucified. And in verses 40 and 41, Luke comments on his sermon by saying, and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a church plant. <laughs> the church has begun to be built from Jerusalem. Now, how does it move from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria? Turn forward to Acts chapter 8. 
Stephen has been martyred. That happens in chapter 7. Saul is ravaging the church, and there's a, a great persecution that breaks out in Jerusalem. So you can see in chapter 8, verse 1, that the church, the, the Christians who were being persecuted, were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and S Samaria. They were pushed out of Jerusalem, scattered in Judea and Samaria. And what do they do? Look at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about, and what does it say? Preaching the word. They went about preaching the word in Judea and Samaria. And Philip's an example of that, starting in verse 5. He went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. There it is. Very simple. Philip and others proclaimed Christ so that by the time you get to verse 14 of chapter 8, it says that Samaria had received the word of God. In fact, in Acts 9.31... It says the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. Christ's church was being built there. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. That's Luke's comment about the church in Judea and Samaria. So the gospel advances from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to the end of the earth. And how does it go to the end of the earth? How's the church built among the Gentiles? Take a guess. <laughs> Proclamation. Look at Acts chapter 10. According to God's providence, many Gentiles are gathered together in the home of Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. And Peter is there with a, a God-given opportunity to build the church. And, and look what he does in Acts 10, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth. That's a good start. And said. He preaches. Once again, he opens his mouth and he speaks and he preaches Christ. He explains all about Christ. And in verse 44, the Holy Spirit interrupts him. What a sweet interruption this is. Look at verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Verse 45. And the believers from among the circumcised, those are the Jews, who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So the building of Christ's church has extended all the way to the Gentiles, to the end of the earth. It's gone out from Jerusalem. It's expanded just like Jesus said it would, all through proclamation, all through simple gospel proclamation. So gospel proclamation is necessary. It's the way that Christ is building his church. Now, why proclamation? How come preaching the word is the means by which the church is built? Well, because that's how sinners are converted. That's how God has determined that dead sinners would be made alive. So let's turn together to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Forward in the New Testament, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. And follow along as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you hear what the Apostle Paul said in verse 5? We proclaim Jesus as Lord. We preach Christ crucified, period. No underhanded ways, right? No cunning, no tampering with God's word, he said earlier. No sleight of hand, no bait and switch, no fancy footwork. Simple, passionate gospel proclamation. The means to building the church. Why? Because, verse 6, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that through the preaching of the gospel, God acts in the lives of sinners the same way he acted 
when he created the world. In Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke and it came to pass. Light be. And poof, there was light. And in the same way, God speaks to the hearts of dead sinners through the proclamation of the gospel. And he says, light be. So if you're a Christian this morning, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, it's because somebody spoke the gospel to you, they proclaimed the gospel, you heard the preaching of Christ crucified, and as you listened, God opened your heart, just like he did with Lydia in Acts chapter 16. And you paid attention to the gospel words that were being spoken, and God, through that preaching, spoke words of creation into your heart. And what was once dead, what was once dark, without form and void, was made alive. And you became light in the Lord. That's how conversion happens. That's how you get saved. That's how you receive forgiveness. The gospel is preached. God speaks through that gospel, and he makes you alive together with Christ. A new creation filled with light. And here's the upshot that I don't want you to miss. God doesn't do this, this new creation disciple-making, church-building work apart from the preaching of the gospel. He only says, let light shine out of darkness when Christ is preached. So we can feed people, and we can clothe people, we can rake their leaves, and we can shovel their driveways, we can host cookouts and game nights, and we can be friendly and fun, and we can gather people together and encourage them, and we can golf and play volleyball and take retreats and have Christmas parties. But if we're not proclaiming the gospel, we aren't doing anything to help people who are dead in their sins. We aren't doing anything to help people who have been darkened in their understanding before God and are enslaved to the fear of death and guilty before God. We're not helping them unless we preach the gospel. The only way that sinners who are dead and dark and enslaved and can be made alive and enlightened and set free, is, set free is through hearing and believing the gospel. They must hear about Christ crucified. Gospel proclamation is necessary. And gospel proclamation is an urgent matter. Where there's no gospel proclamation, there's no salvation. So please turn to Romans 10. We're moving quick and we're moving all around. Romans 10, page 946 if you're using a pew Bible. Read along with me Romans 10, verses 13 through 17. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So this passage I just read begins with a promise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if a person calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God promises to, to save him or her from their sins and to rescue him or her from hell. But a person can't call on him without believing. And he can't believe if he hasn't heard. And he won't hear if nobody preaches. And no one will preach without having been sent. And all this is wrapped up with a summary statement in verse 17 so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So do you see the logic? Gospel proclamation is urgent because it's necessary for salvation. And without it, people will remain alienated and estranged from God. They will remain in their sins, enslaved and dark and dead. They will continue on a pathway to hell and eternal punishment. All people throughout this world, all eight billion people, were born in Adam. Every single one was born a sinner. Every single one is guilty before God. And all are destined to die as a result of sin. You can poll doctors and coroners and funeral directors. Ten out of ten people die. 
And God told Adam plainly in the very beginning that if he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. And that's exactly what happened when Adam disobeyed. We were all plunged into sin, and death has loomed over us ever since. And the only hope we have is to call upon the name of the Lord. God has graciously provided the Lord Jesus Christ to be the very Savior that we need. When John the Baptist saw him, he declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God didn't owe it to us, but out of his mercy and love, he did send the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and to rescue us from hell. Praise God. But no one can call upon the name of the Lord if they haven't believed and heard. And no one can hear if none go and preach. If nobody proclaims the gospel. So this is urgent. Billions of people are in their sins and headed for hell, and the only hope that they have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that 150,000 to 170,000 people die every day in our world? In 2023, there were 61 million people who died in the world, according to the UN. That's 167,000 people per day, or 116 people every second passing from this life and entering into eternity. 116. That's overwhelming to me. It's hard for me to even know what to do with numbers like that. But I, it helps me feel the urgency of what the church has been tasked to do. Because CMC, we are Christ's ambassadors. As the church, you've been entrusted with the message of salvation. You have the treasure of the gospel in jars of clay. And like me, you're weak and frail and afflicted vessels, but you've been given the truth of the gospel. You've been forgiven and made alive and set free from your sin, and you've been rescued from hell. And as ambassadors for Christ, you're meant to go and to preach so that other sinners might hear and believe and call upon the name of the Lord. So look at one more text with me. Turn back to 2 Corinthians, this time chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, church, you've been given the, the ministry of reconciliation. You have the message of reconciliation. So the urgency isn't just an urgency kind of out there. It's, it's not a problem that doesn't concern you or a problem that you can't do anything about. Yes, there are, are many sinners that are apart from Christ and on a pathway toward hell. But you, church, have good news. You're ambassadors for Christ. That's what verse 20 says. God is making his appeal through you. The only way that God appeals to the lost and dying world is through the witness of the church. That's the only way. And so your role is critical. Our role is, is critical. And it's urgent for you to see that God has called you to be his ambassadors. So when you implore someone to be reconciled to God, when you beseech them to come to Christ, when you plead with them and entreat them to repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ, God is appealing to them himself through your witness. When we testify to the gospel as individuals or when we proclaim Christ together in the assembly, we are acting as ambassadors, witnesses sent to herald Christ with the hope that some will ultimately call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. 
And then they become ambassadors who appeal to others. And that's the church construction project that we're a part of. Sir, are you hanging with me? We've moved fast. We've looked at a number of texts. So let's just step back for a minute and catch our breath. Jesus is making good on his promise to build the church. Which means, as the king now seated at God's right hand, he's exercising his authority to make disciples of all nations. He's plundering the enemy. And he's rescuing lost sinners from hell. And he's doing it through the proclamation of the gospel. Proclamation that comes from the mouths of his ambassadors. Amb ambassadors like you and me. So the proclamation of the gospel is necessary. And it's urgent. And your role as Christ's ambassador is urgent. So this call on us as a church is, is crucial. It's critical. CMC, the, the need is pressing. Your role is very central in Christ's building of the church. And I'm wondering this morning, are you compelled to act in response? Does the necessity and the urgency of what we've talked about stir you up to sacrifice and to lay down your life. How are you doing being encouraged to persevere in faith by denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Christ? Does it encourage you? It did for Adoniram Judson. Powerfully. Let his example spur you on this morning, the way it's been spurring me on all week. Listen to the story of Judson's conversion. After graduating from Brown University, where he had met and befriended Jacob Eames, you remember that name, and hardened his heart toward the church and its gospel, he spent a, a summer down in New York City. And there he enjoyed being out from under his parents' watchful eyes, and he escaped the need to always attend church, and he pursued a desire to experience the theater and perhaps write plays. So he joined a traveling band of actors and began to live a life that he later described as reckless and vagabond. Those were his words. Now, bands of New York City players weren't known for their high morality. Judson's living conditions were dirty, and they were ever-changing. He was poor and disappointed with all that the big city had to offer. The theater life just wasn't all that it was cracked up to be for Ed and Iram. So, maybe, feeling much like the prodigal son, he trudged his way back toward Massachusetts. And from everything I've read, he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was going to do. He had recovered his horse, which he had left at his uncle's, and was riding somewhere, I think, in western Massachusetts, where he ended one particular night at the inn of a small, bustling town. And the innkeeper there had one final room available, but he warned Adoniram that the, the room was very undesirable. It was a room adjacent to where a man was very sick and dying. But Judson was exhausted, he didn't care, so he took the room. But he couldn't sleep. The man indeed was dying, gasping and groaning all night long, coughing and sputtering. People were attending to the man throughout the night, speaking, moving about in the room. Rest was far from Judson, and he remained awake all night. And while he lay there, listening to all this commotion next door, he couldn't help but to contemplate the state of the man's soul. When this fellow died, would he go to heaven or would he go to hell? He kept turning that question over in his mind. It plagued him. Then he started wondering about his own soul. What would happen if he were to die? And try as he might, he couldn't press down the reality of hell. And he couldn't push away the reality that hell awaited him. He had tried to ignore it. All summer long, he'd been trying to turn his back on God, but in this mo moment, confronted with the very sounds of death, he could not disregard the reality of hell. It troubled him all night long. And in the morning, after some fits of sleep, Judson queried the innkeeper about the dying man. And the response was short and simple. He's dead. And the abrupt answer arrested Adoniram, and he asked the innkeeper, who was it that died? Who was this man? And the answer, a young man from Brown University named Jacob Eames. That's right. The man who had died in the room next door was none other than his friend from college, from Brown University. Can you believe that in God's providence? Can you imagine how that must have arrested Judson's attention? 
that morning. And as the story goes, he returned to his horse and he only had one word stuck in his mind, lost. Jacob Eames was lost, lost to this world and lost to an eternity of terror. Adoniram was convinced that his old friend had immediately passed into hell. And this is what Courtney Anderson writes in his biography of Judson called To the Golden Shore. That hell should open in that country inn and snatch Jacob Eames, his dearest friend and guide, from the next bed. This could not, simply could not, be a pure coincidence. End quote. So at this point in his life, after having heard and, and so closely experienced death and the death of a friend, Adoniram Judson was absolutely convinced that hell was real. And he knew that only faith in Jesus Christ could rescue him from its terror. Now, according to his own testimony, he wasn't saved that day, but he did immediately return home to his parents. And it wasn't long before he was professing faith in Christ and attending Andover Seminary. And at Andover Seminary, again down near Boston, Judson learned about Burma and its people, all pagans, no knowledge of Christ, no gospel witness, one soul catapulted into hell after another with no witness from Christ. And he learned of a new opportunity. There was a, a fresh allowance for missionaries to come into Burma. And with that, the decision was made. Go and proclaim the gospel as an ambassador for Christ with the hopes that some would hear and believe and call upon the name of the Lord. And like I said in the beginning, it took six years of preaching Christ before there was one person that responded. But fast forward 40 years and there were churches planted and thousands of Christians. I read that at one time, at the time of his death, there were as many as 60 churches in Burma and over 7,000 believers. That's crazy. Judson translated the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, into Burmese, a translation that's still used today. And he wrote a Burmese dictionary and other books to accompany the Bible. It's amazing. All manner of sacrifice and all manner of great accomplishments for Christ's kingdom, simply motivated by a dogged conviction that hell was real and that the gospel of Jesus Christ could rescue sinners from its terror. So Christ Memorial Church, let me ask you this. Do you believe that hell is real? Are you living like hell is real? The Bible is God's revelation about all that is real and true. It's God-breathed and right and true. And it says much about the brevity of this life, likens it to a, a vapor or a breath or a mist, something that comes and goes very quickly. And it has a lot to say about eternity, the importance of valuing it and anticipating it. Jesus spoke often about eternity. He had a lot to say about heaven, and he had even more to say about hell. Listen to John 5, verses 28 and 29. This is Jesus speaking. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. That's resurrection. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Do you hear what Jesus is saying with that statement? He's saying that, that all people, all 8 billion people that currently live on earth will be raised from the dead and will experience eternity. And some will experience eternal life, joy, fellowship with God, and others will experience what John in the book of Revelation calls the second death. Conscious, painful judgment in the lake of fire, forever separated from God. This is the reality from the lips of Jesus. This is the God-breathed truth of Scripture. Hell is real. And every person born deserves to go there. All are born in Adam. All are guilty of sin. You deserve to go there. I deserve to go there. It's warranted. Our sin is against an eternal God who's infinitely holy. You've disobeyed him. You've thrust off his authority. You've disregarded him. And apart from faith in Jesus Christ, hell is our destiny. So if your family and friends haven't heard and believed the gospel and called upon the name of the Lord, then hell awaits them. It does. It's no different for your coworkers, 
and your neighbors, your classmates, those in your community. Without Jesus Christ, no one can be rescued from hell. There is salvation in no one else, Peter said in Acts 4.12. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Some of you here know the gospel and yet you refuse to believe in Christ. The rest of you who do believe in Christ are surrounded by people who don't know the gospel. And if they don't know the gospel, they don't know the saving grace of Jesus Christ because the gospel and its proclamation are absolutely necessary. Now, think with me for a minute, if you can bear it, about the hell that awaits those who haven't heard the gospel and believed in Christ. Jesus says that they will be raised to the resurrection of judgment, which means they will have resurrected bodies and they'll be conscious they will be thinking and feeling. They'll be alert. I think they'll be more awake than they've ever been. And they'll experience fresh terror, unlike anything that they've experienced before. Jesus warns about hell with vivid imagery. He describes it as the eternal fire. He speaks of the fires of hell. He refers to unquenchable fire. Hell's like being thrust into a burning lake of fire where waves of divine wrath splash against you repeatedly like water on the shore. Jesus says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, an eternal response of sorrow and grief, of recrimination and regret, exactly what the rich man communicated in our scripture reading from Luke 16. He was in torment. He was in anguish. He longed for for the relief of just one drop of water. And Jesus says that hell is a place of outer darkness. It's being cast out of God's presence into a place of sheer loneliness and hopelessness. It's suffering the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. At the Quebec mission strip, I illustrated this by talking about solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is an enhanced, escalated form of imprisonment where the incarcerated person is placed in a, a small cell with no windows and no contact with other people. And if the prisoner's lucky, he gets some light, maybe an hour a day to come out. And the United Nations considers it cruel, inhuman, and degrading for anyone to remain in solitary confinement for more than 15 days. Prisoners in solitary confinement are known to experience psychological trauma, depression, paranoia, delusions, insomnia, heart palpitations, hallucinations. It's terrifying. It, it sounds awful. Now imagine e eternal, eternal solitary confinement. Complete and utter isolation from all other people and from God himself forever. There's no party in hell. No crowd of people to commiserate with. Don't buy that lie. Just complete isolation. No light. No time of reprieve. No common grace. Right now, sinners everywhere enjoy God's common grace. And they take it for granted. He causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He makes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good. There are delights of all kind for all people. Food when they're hungry, drink when they're thirsty, happy relationships family and friends, health and prosperity, untold joys that all can be attributed to God's common grace. And they're taken for granted now, but in hell, they will all vanish. There will be no light, no relationships, no love, no hope of escape, just torment forever and ever, eternal loneliness, eternal darkness. I mean, it's almost too much to bear, isn't it? You don't want me to keep going. You wished I'd have stopped sooner, actually. This hell is real. Hell is real. And you know people who are headed there. You might be headed there. Some of you hear the gospel week after week, and you remain in your unbelief. It amazes me. And maybe today is the day that you'll wake up and respond to Christ's offer of salvation. What, what sin in your life is so enjoyable? What worldly pleasure is so valuable? What comfort is so alluring that you're willing to trade it 
for eternal terror. I would beg you not to be that myopic, that, that nearsighted. Jesus is willing right now, today, to deliver you from the wrath to come. That's why he came and died on the cross. That's why he was raised from the dead. And he's now able to save you to the uttermost, completely. And he's inviting you today to come to him and to put your faith in him. So I'll say to you today, come to Christ and be rescued and delivered from the terrors of hell. And CMC, you know people, you know people who are headed to hell. You're surrounded by them. There are about 170,000 people in Chittenden County. Some are your neighbors, some are your coworkers, some are your classmates. Many are UVM students, many are medical professionals at the UVM Medical Center. Many work at the Air Force Base. Many work at Global Foundries, or they cut your hair, or they serve your lunch, or they sell you your groceries. And most of them don't know the gospel. Almost all the UVM students I meet know nothing of the gospel. My barber, he doesn't know the gospel. My neighbor, I couldn't tell you if he knows the gospel. That's convicting. What if I'm the only person that he knows who can proclaim it to him? Some people I know have heard and rejected the gospel. I can't control their response, but at least I know they've heard the gospel. Maybe they've begun to understand it. What percentage of the 22,000 people in Essex do you think knows the gospel? What do you think? What percentage of the 21,000 people in South Burlington know the gospel? It's not Burma in 1812, but gospel ignorance is high, gospel proclamation is low. I think that's true. Which means people all around us are headed for hell, and they're clueless about the only Savior that can rescue them from its terror. And what about your family? What about your friends? What about your coworkers and your classmates and your neighbors? Without Christ, they're destined for hell. And the only way they will hear and believe and call upon the Lord is if we go and proclaim the gospel, if we preach the gospel. And brothers and sisters, you have Christ. God sent you the gospel. You heard it one day, and he said, let there be light. And he spoke light into your dark and dead soul. What grace? What grace? He made you alive together with Christ. All the torment and agony of hell that you deserved was placed on Jesus Christ at the cross. He experienced the fire of God's anger and he experienced the, the darkness of God's rejection when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's mercy. Praise God for that grace. God's wisdom did once devise the plan where all our sin and pride was placed upon the perfect lamb who suffered, bled, and died, just like we sang. Oh, the glory of the cross that you, oh God, would send your son for us. He rescued us from hell. He delivered you, brother and sister, from your sin and your pride, and he has brought you safely into his presence. Praise God. And that's why we're willing to sacrifice. The next line in the song says, I gladly count my life as loss. That's right. The reality of hell and the grace of the cross change your perspective. We just need God's help to keep them in the forefront of our minds and our hearts. You've been rescued from eternal terror and forgiven. You look around and see multitudes facing a certain judgment, and then you become increasingly eager to sacrifice for their eternal good. And this is why we're willing to sacrifice in order to plant a church, because it will spur us all on in evangelism and help us proclaim the gospel to more people. It'll help us press on in making Christ known at UVM and surrounding colleges. It'll help us establish a gospel beachhead, Lord willing, in the South Burlington, Burlington area. Evangelism requires sacrifice, doesn't it? Planting a church and expanding our church's reach takes sacrifice here and there. If you stay or if you go. Because it's a selfless effort. If you're going to care for eternal souls and labor to proclaim the gospel to the lost, if, if you're going to live life on mission, then you must live selflessly. And we can be our worst enemies, at least I can, because often I'm not very good at being selfless. 
I'm not. Then you're probably not either. But the love of Christ that's yours, brother and sister, urges you to live selflessly. It compels you. I love 2 Corinthians 5.14, which says the love of Christ controls us, or it compels us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. That means, Christian, that Jesus died for you, and therefore you have died. Died to a life of self-centeredness. And then in verse 15 it says, And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. What a verse that is. Church, Christ is empowering you right now by his Spirit to live for him. You're no longer enslaved to sin and living only for yourself, trapped in your, your own little selfish world. No, no. You can now gladly sacrifice for the eternal good of other, others. You're free to do that. You can feel burdened by the reality of hell, and you can do something about it. Because taking the gospel to the lost takes selfless work, and God empowers you to accomplish that. Planting a church is hard and toilsome. Gospel proclamation requires lots of initiation, doesn't it? I know because I'm an introvert, and it's exhausting. You have to overcome your own ease and comfort. You can't be passive. You can't get away with coasting thoughtlessly through each day and week or allow yourself to be distracted by all your personal concerns. That's hard. Gospel proclamation requires endurance. You can't be deterred by one or two no's and get discouraged and stop. You, you can't shrink back because conversations sometimes get awkward. Gospel proclamation requires you to, to die daily. You do that when you're driven by a love for others, when you want to, to serve them eternally. Sacrificial evangelism in your personal life and in the life of our church and our forthcoming effort to plant a church, all sacrificial evangelism is motivated by a love for others. And if you're convinced that hell is real, if you're convinced that hell is real and that the only gospel that can save is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only way that a sinner can be rescued from its terrors through faith in Jesus Christ, then you sacrifice gladly. That's what Adoniram Judson did. He lived life on mission. Forty short years of difficulty and suffering that eventually resulted in a flourishing Burmese church. Thousands of congregations when all was said and done. Hundreds of thousands of believers. I'm sure he and Nancy don't regret the sacrifice and the hard work that they put in. And neither will you when you go to your master and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. May God give us the grace to lay down our lives for the lost and to serve him boldly all our days. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you've given us scriptures, a revelation of these truths, and you've given us preaching to help drive them into our minds and hearts. And again, we confess that we need your help to have these weighty gospel realities stirring us up. And we pray that through his spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ might compel us to be effective ministers for the gospel. Not because we're under a guilt trip, but because you are spurring us on and you're being a help to us. So give us much grace, O oh God. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.